Welcome to today's webinar, the one sentence wow, writing a compelling book marketing hook. Um, and we've kind of broken it down into three steps, but just to warn you, they're not necessarily like easy steps. You know, so often we hear like three easy steps or three quick steps. Not, they're not exactly quick or super easy. They're not complicated, but it does take some thought. So um, just so we're all, um, ready for that. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Meredith Eaton. I am the uh, CEO of Eaton Press, which is a self-publishing services company. So we work with um, people who want to write nonfiction books. We help with the writing and the publishing and the production of those books. And I am I've joined up with Judy so that we could create Book Marketing Society as a way to then support clients through the process after the book is on sale through the marketing phase marathon. So I'm gonna let Judy introduce yourself. Okay, uh, Judy Baker, the Badass Book Marketing Mentor. And I am an author as well as a book mentor. And that means I help you turn on your true fans. Getting people to know about you, know about your book is probably one of the things that writers don't want to do because I would say, like me, you may be an introvert. And even if you're not an introvert, telling people about your book is hard. And I realized that my clients at one point were all authors as well as business owners. And it's so important to create a good message that tells people that you can help them. And that's what I do. I, I walk you through creating your messaging, helping get that out in the world and helping you get out of overwhelm because there's so many things you could be doing, but step-by-step step, we can build your true fan base. Great. All right. So first let's talk about what exactly do we mean by one sentence wow. So just to put it into context, um, this could become a press release headline. This could be um, the opening line on your back cover or a line in anywhere in your back cover description. Um, it could be your pitch headline when you are um, soliciting for speaking opportunities. It can come up in a lot of different uh, places, but basically what it is, however you use it, is it's the core essence of your book boiled down to one sentence so that the reader gets enough information quickly to decide if they then want to learn more. So if they want to read the rest of your press release or read the rest of the description on Amazon or on the back of your book. So that's why it matters. And that's what we call the hook, right? Because you're grabbing your potential reader. It's also a way to weed out the people who are not your ideal audience because it may seem somewhat counterintuitive, but you don't want people who are not the right audience reading your book. They're not going to get enough out of it. They're not going to relate to it the way that you want, and it doesn't do anybody any good. So it's attracting the right people and pushing away the wrong people. So no one's wasting their time. So step one, we need to do some research on your target audience. And this is the main reason I said these are not necessarily three quick steps or three hacks to do this because you do have to put some work into it. So you need to really get to know your target audience. And the more you research, the more you can know about them, the better you're going to do both with this particular exercise, but also with all of your marketing, all of your um, publicity approaches. So with some key things that we want to know, what keywords does your target audience identify with? Um, and that can be different for, you know, every population and every target audience has different keywords and you want to really zero in and you want to make sure to avoid any keywords that may be that they don't like to be associated with. Um, and so you do that research by talking to people who are in that community by finding where they gather. So digitally, mostly. Um, you know, Facebook groups that they're in, um, conferences that they attend, networking events that they attend, that kind of thing. And just figure out how they're identifying themselves. Social media, any of, you know, social media accounts of influencers, if, if 
your genre has influencers like that. Um, you want to look at what books they're reading while they're waiting for your book. So what is your competition? What's already in the space? And the easiest way to do that, go to Amazon, pretend you are your target reader and type in what you would type in to, to find your topic and see what comes up. And then take a sampling of those books that comes up and look at the reviews. So see what people are saying. You know, you wanna find some that have a lot of reviews and some that have um, less reviews, some that are you know, super popular and some that are maybe a little less popular just because sometimes the super popular ones get overrun with um, uh, positive reviews that aren't necessarily super legitimate. If they have like 7,000 reviews, it can get lost in there. So you wanna get a good sampling and you wanna look through and you wanna look for trends in the reviews. So something that most people are saying they really like about the book. So, you know, might be like, really like the uh, exercises at the end of every chapter, or I really like the real world examples. Um, I really like that she told us her personal story and I can relate to her, that kind of thing. Things that come up over and over and over in the reviews. And then you wanna look for the negative trends. What comes up over and over? I didn't like the lack of application. Um, I didn't like that it stayed so, that she was so um, big picture and philosophical, whatever it is. And that is that's gonna tell you where you're gonna slide in to this field, the genre where these books already exist and they're already out. So what is the hole that you're gonna fill? Because that is something you're gonna need to communicate to your audience, why is your book different? Well, because you solved this problem. That information also, if you're um, starting your book, if you haven't written your book yet, that is also really good research to have. And that can help you plan your book as well to make sure that you're targeting right in to what is needed in your genre and by your audience. And then what is it that you're doing that's different? What problem are you solving that hasn't already been solved? Or what new way of solving a problem do you have? Or what new philosophy perspective, you know, any of that kind of thing that is different. What is it that you're doing that's different? And so depending on how well you know your genre and your audience, and depending on how big your audience is, you may be able to get all these answers with a little bit of research. You may have to do a whole lot of research. So it just depends, but you'll kind of have a sense of when you have a good feeling, you've gotten enough research to move forward. So after we have done the research, step two is we write a long blurb. So we refer to this as the back cover description. If you've already written your book, don't worry about it. It doesn't have to be your back cover. It's just an easy way to talk about it because everyone kind of knows what the back cover is. So we're starting out by writing a long thing. And here's a little formula that I use with my clients for writing that back cover, that big marketing blurb. So first you're gonna answer the question, who is this book for? Which brings in those keywords. What keywords will your audience identify with it? And you wanna use those. And you write this out one to two sentences. What does this book do for them? Alternatively, how does this book solve their problem? Or what new or different, what is new or different in your book compared to your competitors' books? And just write about two, four sentences-ish on that. If you want to write more, you can. I find it's always easier to pare down than beef up. So you can start this process as just a brain dump and then you know keep refining it and working backwards, whatever works for you. And then finally, why are you the person that they should trust to provide this information? Or alternative, why is this book the book that will solve their problem? And try to answer that in one to three sentences. And now you can answer those questions very directly. And then if you did want to use this as a long, you know, back cover or a full blurb for Amazon or press release, then we can go back and dress it up and put some more, you know, marketing language in and some prettier um, sensory words and that kind of stuff, more descriptive words. But if you're really just getting to this one sentence, then you can just focus on answering these questions directly. So then step three, now we're going to back it up. We're going to 
um, start paring it down. So the first thing is, what is your book really about? You want to be able to explain your book in 30 seconds or less. Um, I used to teach storytelling, um, nonfiction storytelling uh, for corporations and stuff, use it for marketing. And so we'd work on a story and we do this exercise where they work on a seven minute story. And then we'd ask them to tell that story in five minutes, in three minutes, in one minute, and in 30 seconds. And it seems very overwhelming and impossible and work so hard on this big long thing. But what happens when you get down to that 30 seconds is you strip away everything that is not important and you get to what is the core. What is it really, really about? And so if you're struggling, I would recommend that you try this example, explain your book in 30 seconds or less and see what comes out. S explain it to somebody, preferably someone who doesn't really know that much about what you do or what your book is about, and then ask them to tell you back what your book is about. It's a really interesting um, experience. We do this in the um, mastermind that I run for planning your book. And everyone comes and they have, they go through this exercise and they write their descriptions and they come into the group and then we have them tell it to each other. And then we have the person who heard it tell the rest of the group, what's it about? And I would say about 80% of the time, <laughs> the person who heard the description either says, I don't really know what it's about or they totally get it wrong. So, and the, the person telling it thinks they're being very clear, but they're using too many buzzwords. They're using only keywords. Um, they're not boiling it down to one idea that's at the core. Is it about parenting? Is it about um, sales? Is it about um, home construction? Is it about uh, epidemiology? Like, get it to that point. And we tend to over explain and dress up our own ideas in our own books. So it's a really good exercise. Um, and then once you've gotten there, go back to the previous exercise. What are the most important keywords? Chances are you've come up with a list of keywords that all apply. What are the, the, the most one or two keywords that are the most popular, the most readily identifiable, etc.? And then you have to decide, is your author name important? Are you willing to give up space in the sentence for your author name? And is the title of your book essential? And there's no universal question. It depends, or no, no universal answer. It depends. It's different for everybody. So for example, if you've written other books that are um, popular, that are known in this audience, then yeah, it may be worth it to put your name in there. If your title is made up of these high priority keywords, if the title is part of giving the essence, then yeah, it might make sense to use the um, title as part of your sentence. The other thing, and I'll show some examples in a second, but the other thing is this doesn't have to be our classic, you know, perfect grammar type little short sentence. This can be a long sentence, it can be a three line sentence. So there's, there's no rule about that, but it can't go on forever. So you do have to make some choices of, of what goes into it. Um, do we have questions or people? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, Lynn was asking from slide two, is it is it better to do this in first person or not? And I kind of gave her it, it depends answer <laughs> because it does. Yeah, yeah, it depends. Um, it. It just, yeah, it depends. Is your, you know, book written first person is, um, well, we'll go through some examples in a second and that might help you sort of um, conceptualize it a little bit better. Um, so are there other, any other questions? That, that was the only one that showed up. Okay, cool. Thanks. So examples. So, and I try to pick a variety of length and focus. So. This is one that New York Times bestselling authors of Switch and Made to Stick. These are very popular books within the business book genre. Um, explore why brief experiences jolt us, elevate us, change us, create extraordinary moments in our life of work. 
to be honest, this sentence is a little bit longer than I think it needs to be, but um, it's one sentence, it works, it has some keywords, you know, New York Times bestseller, that's some, some credibility. The titles of their other books, and note here, they use the titles of their previous books that were in, this author's written, uh, they've written several, like many, many books. These are the most popular that they've written. So they use the titles, not their names, because most people can't tell you the name of the person who wrote Made the Stick, but most people have heard of Made the Stick. So it's a very, you know, clear why they made that, um, why they made that choice. And then, you know, the um, experiences jolt, elevate extraordinary moments in our life. So it's like, okay, if that, if that resonates with you, you're going to read some more. Um, this is an example of a press release headline, and this is an unknown author um, who is doing some different sort of groundbreaking work in um, interfaith religion with for children. So acclaimed nonfiction book for kids fosters much needed religious literacy. So doesn't matter the title of the book, doesn't really do anything. Her name isn't going to do anything for anybody. But the book has won several awards, so it's acclaimed, and then the much needed and religious literacy. So it's not even getting into interfaith because what she found, interfaith is a keyword that matters for people who care about interfaith, but it is a negative keyword for people who don't want to discuss interfaith, who just want to focus on their own religion. However, some of some people within those communities. With, are still interested in her books because they're just, they might include some of the stuff from their own religion. It's, it's a complicated, I don't even understand this one, my clients, I don't even understand this whole world of this interfaith. But what she learned, and this is her second book, and so what she learned on her first book was interfaith is sometimes the right keyword and sometimes not the right keyword. And so for mass distribution, like this press release that was a national nationally distributed press release, they, her publicist went with just religious literacy. So it's not lying, it is religious literacy. And so it may attract people who have a negative idea of interfaith, but are open to what she might be saying. So again, there's a lot of, you know, but she had to do a lot of, she had to really get to know her audience to figure that out. So the next one um, is, is a very different book. So maybe you should talk to someone. So it's um, nonfiction, but it's a creative nonfiction. So I just threw this in here just as another example, but um, it makes it very clear that it's revolutionary, and it's candor, deeply personal, yet universal, tour of hearts and minds, providing the rarest gifts, boldly revealing portrait, disarmingly funny, illuminating account. So again, this is very long, this is longer than I might normally recommend. However, I think it makes sense because this is a little bit of a tricky genre. The book in a lot of ways reads like fiction, but it's not fiction. It is raw, it's emotional. And so if you make it sound too much like fiction, the wrong people are gonna read it. If you make it sound too much like an actual therapist's nonfiction book that's very dry, you're going to lose this whole category of people who want to read something that's funny, you know. So there's a lot. This is sort of a genre straddling book, and so the effort of marketing it and finding that hook gets a little bit harder. So in this case, I really think this long hook makes sense. And then finally, we have no matter your goals, Atomic Habits offers a proven framework for improving every day. So. This is an example of very brief and part of where it will catch your attention is because it tells you a little, but not a lot. So you're maybe inclined to read a little bit more, um, but it's an example of, again, using the title because the title uses keywords. So it's about habits. It's about um, creating habits that change your life. So we have, you know that, we have the title of the book, proven framework for improving every day. And the, uh, dash draws the eye too, which is part of the whole thing. So um, 
the everyday jumps out at you. So you really feel like, oh, this book will really make a difference in my life. And if you're in the, the, um, in the, in the market for some habit forming books or whatever, you know, this is going to appeal to you. So are there any other questions before we, or, oh, you're on mute, Judy. What's funny is all, all but one of the books are in my library. <laughs> I went, oh no, <laughs> I'm dying. I, I'm serious. Just the religious one is the only one that I don't never heard of, but I, yeah, I well, all the other ones. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's a new, a new author. Yeah. Um, so and I don't know if you have any other thoughts. I know that you work with some of the stuff too. So if, jump in at any time if you want to add. Well, I think, I think you gave a very clear idea of why each of these works and why they can break the rules because you can break the rules because there aren't hard and fast rules of what should go on your back cover. Um, and all of these work. And it, what you'll notice is the first one, because they've written multiple books, that is the ticket. And yeah, people don't remember their names. I happen to remember their names because I, I really love both books. <laughs> so that is usually not the key issue. Unless it's a celebrity, uh -huh. their name doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, you know, James Clear does have a big following, but I'll, I'll bet you 90% of the people who buy Atomic Habits never heard of his name before. They don't yeah. care about that. They care about the results. And that's what's really beautiful about each of these. It's about the results that are produced by these books. Yes, and that's an excellent point too, uh, that the people don't care about the name, they care about the results. And I get that a lot from first-time authors and people who are self-publishing and they think, oh, is anyone gonna care if I have a name that no one knows and I'm self-published? Like, will that remove all legitimacy, all credibility? And the answer is always no, because People don't, most people don't even know if a book is self-published. I do a, a exercise sometimes where I have people go on Amazon and find me, show me a book and show me how you know it's self-published and most of the time you can't. Um, so that doesn't matter. And the names don't matter. We have people who are relatively famous, but their names are not what they're leading with because what it is is what can the book do for me? What can I get out of the book? What are the results? What are the outcomes? And that's also reviews is super important. Um, getting people to review your books is, is more, um, is a better social currency and legitimacy than having a name that people know. Even having awards on books is great, but it is not a deal breaker if you don't have awards. Like it really is about, especially with nonfiction, it really is about what you deliver if you deliver on your promise for the book then people don't care who wrote it and they don't care how it got to them whether it was by a publisher or not so now we're going to do a practice um, because it's often easier to see clearly other people's books than it is to or you know descriptions than it is to see your own so this is from Brene Brown's book, um, and it's clearly two sentences. And so the practice is to take these two sentences and make them one sentence. And we will give you a few minutes if you wanna try to go through and just think about it right now. If anyone would like to um, do it out loud, share with the group how you might change it, um, we would love that. And then after this, we'll have the opportunity for you to work on your own um, if you want to. If not, we'll just move into questions and you can do it on your own time. But if anyone is ready with information, you know, the background that you need for your own book, um, or if you already have some marketing materials and you want us to kind of weigh in on them, happy to do that as well. So just pause here for a second um, and think about this exercise. I'm just going to look at the chat real quick.
All right. So um, does anybody want to share their thoughts on how I might rewrite the sentence? If not, it's fine and we'll move on, but. I can give it a go. Yes, good. Yeah, I was just thinking you could uh, start with a second uh, paragraph. So in this new book, Brown uses da 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 to help you cultivate braver, more daring leaders. And, and you know, doing so in her no BS style, you know, like just kind of. Yeah, just yes, I like together. that. So starting with the second, uh, second paragraph. I think that's great. And I don't remember uh, yet. Yeah, Dare to lead. So you might even it might make sense to use the title, and this as a way of shortening up some of the keywords. Could be another way to go, but I like that. Anybody else have thoughts? All right, that's fine. Um, then we will jump in. So now is your turn to write your one sentence wow. And we have, because we have a small, smaller group, um, like I said, I'm happy, we're happy if someone wants to jump on like the hot seat and we can talk through your stuff, even if you don't have all of your audience research or you know, know all of those details, um, we're still happy to talk through it. Um, with you, or you can also come back to us later. You can reach us. Um, we'll have our contact information at the end. So, um, so let's pause for a second in case anybody wants to jump in. What would be great is if you want to pop it into the chat, if you have something so we can all take a look. I mean, let, let's be brave. Let us be brave. That's the only way we're going to get feedback. Oh, okay, Lynn, you've got a good point. You don't have a title for your book yet. What's the subject matter? Um, I wrote a book about uh, my mom, uh, mainly my mom and our cancer journey together. Right. Yeah. So, and you know, you know my background and my story about my mom, but. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, and the reason that I wrote it is to help other families, especially daughters of moms, mm -hmm. um, to know like what in the hell to, to do or, or like, it's kind of, there's resources in there about what, what we did and how we navigated after the initial year of like being scared to death and like really never having dealt with something like this right um so i want i want it to be of some encouragement and comfort to other families mm -hmm. who might relate to this thinking this would never happen in their family and then it does and it's and it's and i also wrote it it's from my journal that i did for the six and a half years um yeah of her journey. Mm -hmm. So I took excerpts from my journal and put them in. So there's, there's some really funny parts too, that I think yeah. people would relate to it if they've ever gone through cancer in their family. Um, and they would also find, I think, comfort in that I could actually make jokes out of something that was so horrifying <laughs> and terrible, but it was, you know, we actually found a lot of funny moments and hmm. yeah, so I don't really know. I haven't done the keyword research yet for, um, and I'm a marketer too, as Judy right. knows. Um, right. but it's different when you're marketing your own stuff, obviously. Yes, very much so. Nope. And, yeah. And I've worked with authors, so I know I've helped launch like five or six books. And so I know it's a, it is a marathon and, <laughs> a lot of like sleepless nights. Um, so, and I put it on hold during COVID because I didn't feel like I could do it justice. Like I was too distracted with the whole pandemic. Yeah. And so I might actually append the book a little bit. I might actually add like maybe towards the end, I'll add something about that, about you know, not publishing the book as soon as I had originally intended. So there you have it. 
I, I have no title. I've got about 300 photographs because I want the photos to, I want the photos to also tell the story. Uh-huh. But <laughs> it's not going to be, so now I have to go through and I have to edit, you know, like which photos right. are, are good mm-hmm. enough quality to use, first of all, and which photos would be okay. appealing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, there's a lot I'm, you can well, tell. I know, I kind of know where you're at in the, in this, because my memoir went on hold too. Yeah. <laughs> For the same reason. Um, why don't you and I talk afterwards? Because I've got some ideas and I think what I was hearing, and I think you and I both have a similarity in our approach. <laughs> it's not about the, oh my God, this is a horrible yeah. diagnosis. It's about the relationships and how you navigated through that and that there is, I know there's humor. I mean, my God, I, yeah. I made some very big gallows humor jokes the whole time. Um, <laughs> because, it, because it just, you know, you can't, you can't just be all sad the whole time. So why don't we talk afterwards? Why don't okay. we talk? Okay. Yeah. But okay. you're, you're in the right, you know, you're in, you're, you're in the juicy part right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so that is the, those are your steps. <laughs> You're not so simple, not so, um, super easy steps to getting to your one sentence. Wow. And if this content was helpful, if you liked it, then we would suggest that you become a member of book marketing society, because this is the kind of stuff that we do every month. Um, we have a second, we have a webinar every month that's just for members and it's a similar topic to this, but, um, we'll go deeper and we get more in depth and more detailed, um, into all the different topics. And there's one every single month. Um, so being a member, you get the steady flow of, um, book marketing information and resources every month, which was our main objective because marketing is, it is a marathon. It doesn't just happen for a minute, for a couple of weeks. It is, it is all the time. And, but it's hard to stay focused and it's hard to keep going. So this way, if you're a member of the society, you're getting constant stream of tools, resources, inspiration, community support, new ideas, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you get to interact with a diverse community of authors and other experts that we will be bringing in and you can pick your membership level. So we have three options, um, emerging author for people who maybe don't have as many, have, or haven't written your book yet, you're starting out, evolving author and eminent author. And mm-hmm. what you get for your membership increases with every, with each level, including at the evolving and eminent, you get time one-on-one with me and Judy. So you get, um, either 30 minutes or 60 minutes with each of us independently. So double um, access, as well as a variety of other things um, that I won't go through and read all of it right now, because you can read it. You can also go to bookmarketingsociety.com to see all the information um, on the website and to sign up. So that is our presentation, but we will stay here. We'll take questions for as long as you want, for as many questions as you have. Um, and here's how you can reach us. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions about this presentation, about anything else. Um, and if you go to bookmarketingsociety.com, you will see a button towards the bottom with the schedule of all of our webinars. So we have a free webinar every month, um, already scheduled for the rest of the year. You'll also see the topics that are the member only webinars. So you can get a sense of that. Um, we also will have a lot of other, we have a template that you'll get every month. We have other trainings, resources, all kinds of stuff, um, that are available to, um, society members. So we'll stop there and we'll switch to questions. Yeah. Why don't we, um, um, want to do, um, want to go to gallery view so we can see each other? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. I will stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Thank um, you so much. I've got to get back to work, but thank you very much. And Judy, you and I will touch base. Oh, great, Lynn. That would be fabulous. Thank okay. you. Take care. Thanks, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
clarify. Um, for you know, I know some of you have published already, and maybe you're getting the response you want, or maybe you've got another book in the hopper. What kinds of things are working for you all, and what you know, how how are you using your book hook? That'd be that'd be great to hear from you all. Yeah. Well, I know Pam, you're in the process of writing your book. Ulrika, you've already published one. Nita and Rob have their main book and they have a big exhibit in San Diego. Oh, I forgot to tell them that. I'll have to, I'll have to let her know. Um, well, yeah. I know you're, you're heavy in the marketing area and Deborah, what about you? You know, we'd love to, we'd love to have this be a conversation. Where is Deborah? Right. I, I had muted myself because like I said, I'm sitting out on my patio and my dog started barking. So uh, you may hear some commentary in the background. Uh, yeah, I have published my book and um, I am still still seeking my path in marketing, I, sh I guess I shall say. Um, I have done some podcast guest appearances mm -hmm. um, for marketing and I, I found I really enjoy that. Um, I like talking to people and um, I guess it's not a surprise that anyone who does a podcast probably likes to talk and is a good conversationalist. So I've done a few podcast um, guest appearances, made a few pitches, but honestly, in the last um, couple months as I've focused more on another writing project, I've slacked off on that. So I think that's why the topic of this um, workshop appealed to me, because I think if I had a better wow uh, sentence for my podcast pitch, I would probably be more effective in booking those appearances. So, uh, and there's my dog barking. <laughs> and someone just walked by. So um, yeah, we'll see. Maybe he'll calm down. Anyway, so yeah, I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry, he got real close now. Anyway, I'll stop there until he- Well, I think you're you're absolutely right. When When you can start, that conversation and you get people to go, you know, light up and they're engaged with what you said, then they'll ask you more questions. And that's really the, that's what marketing is about. It's about getting people's attention and then, you know, seeing where it goes from there. Um, Ulrika, how are, how are you doing with your book? Well, the book that I, I did publish, I was really just a small chapter in a, uh, an anthology, is that what it's called? Anthology. Like, anthology, okay. So anyway, that one, I feel like I'm, I'm not working on marketing that. It was just uh, dipping the toe into the whole thing and be part of something. But now I'm writing my own book. And um, I, um, I mean, I see how this uh, like a hook or getting it really concise would be super useful. And I mean, you know, Judy, it's, my book is about time management and it's about really a soulful sort of organic approach to time management. And I like to say that I'm the time management coach who does not believe you can manage time. Uh, so I introduced some other ways that you can manage other things that help you uh, experience time as uh, meaningful and rich. Right. And I, I think because you because you focus so much um, in the past couple of years on honing your skills as a speaker, this is kind of a translation of those skills into how you do the same thing on with your book. Because you know people will show up to a, to a talk when the title is like, oh my goodness, what's going on there? And the same thing applies with your book. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And Pam, where where are you in the process? Because we haven't talked in a while. Uh, yeah, that's because I've been so overwhelmed. I'm a, for those of you who don't know, uh, which most of you don't, I am a special ed preschool teacher who has been spending incredibly long hours this year trying to make education work. And I'm going back to the classroom in two weeks, so a week and a half with some amazing restrictions. So I haven't really done a whole lot. Uh, I'm illustrating the book as well as writing it. It's a children's book, so it's a little different from what most of you are doing. The interesting thing is that when I started it, I thought I was just doing an alphabet book for children. And then somebody uh, at uh, the writers, Redwood Writers, when I was explaining the book, she said, this is not an alphabet book. She said, this is a nonfiction book for children. And it is because it's poetry that has um, some information in it, but it's fun. And then there are fun facts at the bottom of the book and then the illustration. So I've been sitting here while we're talking, also sort of doodling over here on you know that one line hook and it's 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 hard because you know it started like i said as an alphabet book but it really now the alphabet is merely just something to kind of shape the book there's 26 mm -hmm. animals and um you know it really could be a book for a wide range and usually for children's books they tell you well is it for three to five year olds is it for six to eight year olds you know, my first line in my book is, you know, a children's book for the whole family, huh. because it really, you know, for the littlest kids, they'll like the art and they will get involved in the fact that there's a letter there. And the older kids, I mean, I had a fourth grade teacher tell me that if this book were available, I would use it for a poetry unit in my class. Oh, and, wow. Right. Because each of the descriptions, Pam is a, is a very gifted painter and illustrator. So each of the poems is about the animal and they're they're wonderful they're beautiful so i think it's you know it's like watching um it's like watching a movie a family movie but there's jokes in there that the parents get and they mm -hmm. right over the kids heads. it's like a and disney so, movie which i think are yeah. really more adult oriented now the kids have no idea what's really going on but <laughs> yeah i um you know i'm at the point now i've got the illustrations done up through S for sloth. And uh, the illustrations just take a lot of time. Um, right. I realized at one point I thought I really wanted to illustrate children's books. And I went, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have to be a lot faster than I am to make a living as an illustrator of children's books. And there's a huge difference between being a fine artist. And I, and I don't mean that you're better than it, just fine art versus illustration, because uh -huh. I'm a huge admirer of illustration. And it's a real, it's a real art in itself. And it's different. Uh -huh. You know, I feel very confident illustrating this book, but I have a lot of other children's books where I'm going, you know what, I don't think you should be the one to illustrate that one. Yeah, I hear you. And I think you've got a good start on your hook. I mean, but I think you're going to need to you're going to need to punch it a little bit further so how what you want in there too is how is your book different than mm -hmm. this is a book for the family but how is it different than right well you know i've just been doodling over here i mean one of them was that it bring you know amazing animals brings a menagerie of creatures to life through fun rhymes amazing facts and whimsical illustrations honey you're done yeah <laughs> Don't keep tinkering. That <laughs> I like that. I mean, what what do you all think? I think that's mm -hmm. a good. I think that works. Yeah. Would well, you I want me know. to take out the thing about a you know a, a children's book for the whole family because it addresses children and the fact that it's got a wide age age group you know, as the lead into. Maybe that could go later, because the other part is what's really critical. It's it, it's introducing kids to really to nature and to science and the poetry and they won't even realize that they're getting introduced to all of those things in one so i mean there's so many ways you could use the book and well, yeah that, those, yeah if i said amazing animals brings uh, a life of, uh what did i say uh, brings to life a menagerie of animals uh through fun rhymes amazing facts and whimsical illustrations and then whatever that line is a fun book or, or something you know a children's right. book for the whole family mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I think you want to make sure, I think one of the key words is if it's 
um, poetry, you know, making sure that the, it's clear it checks all those boxes. Cause I right. think for a lot of parents that they're going to focus either, you know, the poetry will jump out at them or the illustrations or the alphabet. Well, do I need so, to say poetry specifically or is rhyme okay? I, it depends. I don't know the content. So I think sometimes poetry puts, you know, if parents like to rhyme with their kids, but I think poetry makes it sound a little more, uh, you know, mm -hmm. intellectual. I, that's why I sort of wanted to stick to just rhymes, you know. Yeah, that that's fine. That would be one of those where I would say do a little bit of research just to yeah. check because yeah. you might hit on something if there is this huge dearth of, if everyone's clamoring for introducing their kids to poetry and that becomes a keyword that maybe has shifted yeah. over time and now it's seen as like a value or if it still is like, oh, that's too esoteric and rhyming is fine. It, it's really interesting because in children's literature, you know, all the editors will tell you, oh, we don't want anything that rhymes. And then you look at the children's classics and e even what's selling now, mm -hmm. a great deal of it is rhyming. What Absolutely. they're really saying is we don't want any bad rhymes. Right. There's yeah. so much of that. Exactly. <laughs> or silly rhymes, fortuitous rhymes, you know, where it's like right. not you saying know. anything, it's simply rhyming. I think that's, and that was where I was not, you know, thinking poetry were rhyming because I think there is a lot of pandering in children's literature right. where it's, it may rhyme, but it's not poetry. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. All it is is rhyming. There's no, there's no substance to it. So if you provide a substance and it's actually educational and it rhymes, right. if there's a way to kind of communicate that, but again, that's where doing some research and checking in with your target reader and see what words resonate with them and right. what. Well, each rhyme know. has something educational in it, but it's usually a little twist or it's a little bit clever or it's funny. Yeah. 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 Yep. I just, can, do you want me to add something? So if, yeah, Pamela, when you share that, I just think this is like a beautiful like invitation to come and play, you know, through playing with words and illustrations. Mm -hmm. And also this like kind of, there's like the multi-layeredness of it just seems yes. really intriguing, both mm -hmm. in the all age groups and the different, if you want to enter through poetry or enter through the letter, like there's all invitation, just kind of. I kind of like that. And somehow I could work in an invitation to play. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. I, I, I think you're definitely onto it. And uh, Nita and Rob, I mean, you've had, you've had very good engagement as you've, as you've been selling the book over this past year. What do you think was, um, you know, how did you craft that? Because I know you worked on it for a long time. Um, well, we worked with some some wordsmiths as well who helped us write the inside cover. Um, we, I mean, it's a project that's several decades old. It's called Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And so it, we knew it was about inspiring hope and action. So that was a big part of it. How do you get people, people's attention um, on these issues without overwhelming them and having them, offering them these wildflower images that they fall in love with and what you love, you want to protect. So there were key words that are used in the environmental movement and key words <laughs> for us that make it emotional without it being depressing. Mm -hmm. I just say, I think that's so important because people do tend to feel overwhelmed with environmental stuff. And it's like, I'm giving up because it does, you know, I can't do anything. So thank you for making a hopeful book. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. And that's why we included 25 things you can do to make a difference so that we didn't just inspire people and then leave them hanging. We mm -hmm. wanted to make it as easy as possible for them to actually take action. You said something in that you said, it, you know, it was an emotional connection that mm -hmm. if you already don't know this, we don't decide up here, we decide in here mm -hmm. what we're going to do. And each of you, when you're describing your book, that's what came forward. It's that emotional hook. People will then look for the intellectual reason, but if you if you miss their emotions, you you know you're going to miss most of the people who are making a decision to buy your book. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. 
And that's where some of the having the right keywords and knowing what words resonate with your audience comes in because a lot of times naming things and, and keywords can be an emotional um, signal to people that they identify with the group or that, you know, that you know them if you're using words that they use on them on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And Pamela, we want to create some children's books nice. based on wildflowers and and environmental issues told by Zora, Rob's spiritual advisor and art critic, who's a little um, beanie baby monkey. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But I like the whole idea of uh, books for the whole family because it is gonna be a lot of different ages that could benefit from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you and I can break the mold on that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. All right, we're almost at the end of our time. If anyone has any last questions or thoughts or anything you want to discuss with each other. <laughs> was, this right. helpful? was this helpful for you all? Did you get something that will help you with your books? I'm close to a hook. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. <laughs> awesome, that's, that's really great. Um, and the other thing I did want to just mention something in the conversation we were just having is you don't have to get everything in that one hook because you will have more follow up right so the idea of the hook is you're bringing them in so that they'll read the rest of it and continue on so don't feel like you have to get every single word and every you know this is your one shot this is your your best shot you're gonna use your best stuff to lure them in and then if you need additional details or clarifications you know you will have additional space to do that so just keep that in mind it can get easy to fixate on fitting everything in that sentence so that's that's not the primary objective so um all right well thank you all so much for coming it was really lovely having you here and, and hearing about your books. Um, you will get a follow up email with a link to this presentation so you can go back to it um, and access it and actually we'll be we're putting it up on our YouTube channel. So what you'll get is a link to the YouTube channel. Um, and then you can see any of the other ones that we have done and any of the future ones as well. So um, that's it will let you go unless, and again, if you have any follow up questions um, or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye.